recording this meeting. Um, so it will be posted on the website. Again, another just transparency uh, feature that we can offer here. So um, uh, the other thing that we're going to do is do a screenshot. Um, and so actually, um, if you're able to turn your camera on, um, if you have a camera that can turn on, if you wouldn't mind doing that, then we can take a screenshot and just for posterity, you know that we're all here together <laughs> on this day. So, uh, and I'll take one, but Alyssa, will you as well? Give me a backup. Richard, do you have a camera? Oh my God, I'm gonna have to get the wife to figure oh, it out. Oh, you know, it's okay. It's okay, Richard. We'll, we'll just go ahead and, and grab one. There is one, but I don't know where it is. I understand. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you for that. Um, so um, introductions. I think um, the best way to do this is uh, maybe for me to call on people and um, we'll just kind of say our names and our role on this committee. And um, let's go ahead and just say one thing maybe that we're grateful for. So always good to keep those things in mind these days. So um, I will start. Um, my name is Carolyn Burke and I'm the uh, Parks and Open Space Planning Manager with the City of Eugene. And um, so I'm uh, happy to be able to facilitate this group and have a lead role in implementing the, um, the bond measure specifically. And um, Right now, I'm really grateful for just amazing uh, coworkers and teammates that really support each other through everything. So we've seems like we've all got our backs and really um, help each other um, in a variety of ways. So that's what I'm especially grateful for right now. So I'm going to um, pass it over to Ethan. Hi all, I am Ethan Wing, Recreation Section Manager. Um, I work alongside Carolyn with this group and I'm happy every time we get to interact, although it's been a long break. Uh, I too am thankful for the many teams that are here in the city doing great work. Uh, it has been a challenging year and a fantastic year to, to see the people rally around each other. I'm also thankful for my, my dog, Dora, who snuck out, uh, as you guys saw. She's a, a boxer lab mix and she's the best thing ever. She's better than the teams, you know. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan. Let's, I'm gonna go around the circle here on my screen. I'll go to Rick next. Uh, good evening, uh, Rick Kincaid. I'm the medical director for the community health centers of Lane County. Um, and I'm uh, thankful for family. Thanks, Rick. And uh, Raina, is next and then I'll go to Chris after Rena. Hi you all, I'm Raina Jackson. I'm at the law school as a marketing specialist and I am a part of the citizen advisory board. I am grateful for my husband who's watching the kids on the other side of this wall. <laughs> uh, and just a note, uh, some crashing may happen but uh, that's the nature of the game nowadays. <laughs> Thanks Raina. Chris. Chris, you're muted. It won't be the last time that happens tonight. Yes, and it's probably the best way. Uh, so I'm Chris Gerard, I'm the Park Operations Manager, and I have a lead role in implementing the operations levy in developed and undeveloped parks. And I guess I'm thankful for the community that we live in that allows us to have such a great park system and voted to pass the bond and the levy. And also the rainy day, being an outdoors person, we need rain and lots of snow. So I'm happy to see that. Optimistic there. Okay, I'm gonna go to um, Molly and then Alyssa. Okay, uh, my name is Molly Rogers and like Raina, I'm on the advisory board. Um, my specialty is you know, product design and inclusivity. So I have that sort of eye as we look at the projects. Um, I look 
you know, to see if they can include people equally. Uh, so that's kind of my role. Um, I am thankful for, um, I'm going to say Green Hill Humane Society. I am a foster, uh, foster mom to many a, an injured and compromised animal. And so um, I can't say enough good things about Green Hill, the support they provide our community. So. Awesome. Uh, it's not like the best time for me to have a pet. So it's, it's a way that I can contribute, but also, you know, get the, get the pet experience. They're amazing. Okay, Alyssa and then Kelly. Hi, I'm Alyssa Gavet. I do community engagement with parks and um, I just help with public outreach and I project manage the annual report that you guys got to review. Um, so yeah, and I am just really thankful for um, family time this holiday season. However, that comes if it's on Zoom or if you know, you're able to see people in person. I'm just really thankful to be able to spend that time with our family. Uh, Kelly and then Richard. I'm Kelly Shabak. I also do community engagement work with Alyssa and I get to work on the communications team on the Bond and Levy efforts, which is a really fun team. And I am grateful for my team that I get to quarantine with my kids and my husband and I also was a foster parent for Green Hill but now I've taken the plunge and I have a dog and a cat so it's a it's kind of crowded around here sometimes and um, my kids are doing well in online school so I'm really grateful for that as well. Thanks Kelly. Okay Richard and then we'll go to Scott. And Richard, you might be muted. You said it happened again, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, Richard Maher, I'm a former race director for Eugene Marathon and on the board. And uh, what I'm thankful for is during this COVID, I'm very thankful for family and how close I've gotten to family because they're the only people I'm associating with, basically. So it, it's, it's been an experience. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Um, Scott and then Jeff. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Yeah, my name is Scott Sanders. I am, uh, have a small wealth management firm here in Eugene, also the president of the Eugene Parks Foundation. So that's kind of my I got connected to the group and just kind of personal attachment and affection for uh, parks and open space in our community. So, um, yeah, I'm thankful for family and for Zoom because without Zoom, we wouldn't be seeing a lot of people right now. So, including all of you. So, thanks, Scott, Jeff, and then Ben. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Perry. I'm the facilities director and. Uh, my team's been working on the projects. And um, I guess the one thing that I'm really grateful for when I think about the work that we're doing is just the partnership we have with Recreation, Craig Smith and Ethan and their team. Um, it's been really cool. You know, projects can be challenging and, and complicated. And um, we've had a really, really cool experience working with everybody and, and making all of this happen. And so I'm, I'm definitely grateful for that. Thank you. I'm just going to try to stop this un unanticipated screen share. I think it's going to end up sharing mine for a second, but that's okay. Because then I can stop it. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Hey, everybody. I'm Ben Klipfel. I am the marketing manager for Library, Recreation, and Cultural Services at the City of Eugene. And I'm part of the communications uh, team along with Kelly and Alyssa and others that uh, is fortunate to work on the communications piece of this project. Um, and it might be weird, but I also am I'm grateful for fall in Oregon uh, coming from the Dakotas. Uh, this is nice out uh, for me. Uh, so I'm, I, I love the rain. And so I'm trying to uh, enjoy that. Uh, as long as it doesn't irritate me, because that'll probably come in about a month, then I'll be sick of it again, so. 
Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, I've got Matt and then Emily. Good evening, all. I'm Matt Rodriguez. I'm the Acting Public Works Director. And um, I'm really thankful for the excellent work that our teams across the city have done in support of the bond and levy in a pandemic amid a bunch of other, you know, tough things that we've gone through this year. I'm also thankful that all of you took the time to show up and, and spend your time with us to talk about this. So thank you for showing up. Emily and then Renee. Hi everyone, I'm Emily Proudfoot. I'm the principal landscape architect in the parks planning office and um, leading the planning components of a lot of the, a lot of the bond work that um, we get to implement, it's very exciting. Um, I am also very grateful for the time I've had with my family <laughs> over the last nine months. I have a senior in high school, so I'm, I'm super grateful to be with her. Um, and then I'm also really grateful for the extraordinary collaboration we've had across the city around some of these projects. And you'll hear a little bit about that with the Riverfront Park project, but it's been remarkable and unprecedented and super awesome. So I'm really grateful for it. Hey everybody, this is Renee Gruby. I'm the director of the Library, Recreation, and Cultural Services Department. And, you know, I'm just really thankful for living in a community that cares so much about everyone, and in particular, parks and recreation services. Um, it doesn't happen like this everywhere. And I really appreciate it, especially during this time when people have been so gracious and so caring for how they take care of each other. So. Thanks for being here tonight. This is awesome. Thanks, Renee. Uh, so Cinnamon and then Craig Carnegie, and we'll wrap up, I think, with Craig Smith. Hi, everyone. I'm Cinnamon Harper. I'm the budget analyst for Parks and Open Space and the Maintenance Division. And I am super thankful for the rain and for firefighters because I got evacuated for the first time in my life this year. So I'm just glad my house is still standing and the rain is putting out the fire. So I'm happy about that. So that's it. Good one. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Craig Carnegie. I'm the Parks and Open Space Division Manager, and I'm grateful for seeing everybody here on this screen and particularly um, our volunteer park and advisory board members. Really appreciate you all showing up. And an even bigger kudos to Dr. Kincaid. It's really good to see him here and considering everything that he's probably going through right now, um, it's really amazing that he even was able to make this meeting. So we really appreciate that. And we're also grateful for all the other medical professionals out there that are working so hard right now. So thank you, thank you for your work. Okay, Craig Smith. And then we'll ask um, our guest, Al, to also introduce himself. Sure, howdy, I'm Craig Smith. I'm the Recreation Division Manager. And I think I'm most appreciative of living in Oregon right now. I went to the Oregon coast to see the King Tide last weekend. Huge waves, big storm, big winds, wonderful outdoors in Oregon. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. I think this is my first uh, time at an advisory committee meeting since about 1979. I was on the committee in the late 1970s with uh, Mayor Bascom and I think Ernie Drapella was the uh, parts manager at that time. And uh, we were busy getting the Greenway bike bridge built across Willamette River at that time. Uh, we, my wife Susan and I moved away in uh, 2000, went to Portland and then Bend. And what we're thankful for is that we're back in Eugene now, we're still looking for a lot or a house and we're enjoying this greatly expanded system of bike trails. It's wonderful to have you, Al. Thanks for joining us. You bet. And we have Jill. Jill, we're just doing a little round of introductions. You can unmute yourself and, and say who you are and, and um, what you're grateful for. Great. Um, I've actually been on the meeting for a while, but I wasn't in a, in it. So I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I sent you a message so that, right. It's like, hello. I just saw it. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, well, hello everyone. Nice to see everyone. Um, you know, this has been a really in interesting time and I'd say 
if I had to be grateful for one thing, it's like the opportunity to, I guess, look at the world in a different way and, you know, be creative on how I do things or how I communicate with people. And, and, you know, I can honestly tell you, it's not always a willing change, but once I wrap myself around it, lots of really kind of fun and interesting things have happened. So that's what I'm grateful for. Thank you, Jill. Okay, well, um, that was great. And um, I think we're ready to do some project tours. And so uh, first up, we're gonna go to Echo Hollow Pool. And I believe that um, Craig Smith and Jeff Perry are gonna kind of talk us through this. So just bear with me for a second while I share my screen. And if somebody wouldn't mind monitoring the chat and let me know if there's something I need to know, because once I share my screen, I don't seem to be able to see much. I'll take care of that. Thank you. So let's see. <clears throat> Hold on, I'll pause it, make it bigger. Okay, you guys ready? Yeah. Sir. You're not seeing my screen, are you? No, ready. no we're still ready, but we haven't seen the screen yet. <clears throat> not yet. Here it comes. Great. So Carolyn, um, I'm going to be verbal and, and actually say push pause right now. Can you do that? Great. I've actually found it difficult today trying to synchronize what I'm saying with a drone flying by. So I've failed at that. Um, so I'm going to do pause and go. How's that? Does that work? Sure. We're definitely going to talk about this. Um, but the, here's Echo Hollow Pool. Uh, not too long ago, actually, very up-to-date drone flyover. Um, I think we all, as a team, last met at Echo Hollow Pool and did a similar presentation on the update of our project. So this is a big one. Um, so Echo Hollow, if you remember, is a very unique pool in that it's always had an indoor-outdoor component to it. And we're going to maintain that as we go into the remodel. but. Um, the unique part about this is that it's been a workhorse over the years for competitive swimming. And we've kept that emphasis as part of its um, design as far as what it provides the community. So Echo Hollow also represents a key part of the Parks and Recreation Systems Plan in that we are going to take care of what we already have. And this pool was built in 1969, I believe, and um, was on the brink, I would say, in the last few years of operating. The bulkhead that separated the indoor and outdoor section of the pool um, was essentially stuck in place and unusable. So, um, so when we started to work on this project, we got instant and significant interest from the competitive swimming community, which makes very, which makes sense. They're very invested in this pool. And so um, you can see at the front end of the, of the pool is a large tank and it was information from this competitive swimming group that we realized we really needed to do as much as we could with this pool as far as providing this competitive swimming opportunity. So that large tank is actually 25 yards by 25 meters. It also has within it a, um, a deep end water polo tank, similar to the one at Amazon pool, which is, means that there's only two in Eugene that have that deep water polo um, opportunity for it. Um, but the main part of this pool is the fact that during the winter season coming up right now, it can handle 78 different competitive teams indoors and out. This outdoor tank will stay open all year long. Um, the other unique side of Echo Hollow that we added, which was essentially based on our business analysis in that if we're going to operate a pool, we need to, be, we need to you know, um, diversify what we're offering. And so this recreation tank really symbolizes 
um, a business model approach to this. We can really make solid revenue off both the competitive swimming and the rec and the recreational swim pieces. And so Echo Hollow is now a very um, complete um, pool to serve this the west side of Eugene. So um, go ahead and spin around there a little bit more, Carolyn. We'll 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 kind of fly toward the north there. And go ahead and stop right about there above these trees. And we're, we're right about there. We're, we're able to save this row of trees for the most part. I think we had to take three out, but we kept most of them, which is great because they create a nice wind barrier. Um, so with the addition of the big tanks here, what we, we ended up having to sacrifice some things. And some of the things we sacrificed were building or, or renovating some of the indoor dry fitness areas upstairs on the in, indoor part of the pool and some of the staff offices and amenities there. But if you look on the on what would be the north end of the pool near the tennis courts, I don't know what you call this officially, Jeff, but it's a, an add-on or an appendage. Um, it's essentially going to be the new entryway into the Echo Hollow pool, which synchronizes it very easily for our staff to control entrance and exiting. And then we build a row of staff offices in the back side of that, which gives them more space. And by, by putting the staff offices on that outside new addition, we were able to expand the interior locker rooms significantly, which is very important for this pool. And so we have a lot more indoor space, privacy space, family change rooms on the indoor sides of our, our locker rooms. So that's a, a, a huge addition to it. Um, you can go ahead and spin around, Karen, let, her, let the drone fly. Um, we won't be able to look inside the pool, but we did have to change the indoor tank because of the um, criteria on the depth of that tank, we had to change it to keep up with, and now you can all get sick. Yeah. sick. <laughs> and realigns itself. Um, what, we're, if you remember right, this sits right next to um, Cascade Middle School and Bethel just passed a bond that will rebuild that middle school next to it. So we're looking forward to that. I also look forward to, um, the whole pool as itself, you see the big black tarp covering the dirt there, that whole area there is gonna be green grass. That's gonna be the recreational hangout family space along with the food cart there that'll be really nice. It'll really make this pool a great place to hang out um, in the summer, even in, um, in, well, yeah, mostly in the summer. We're gonna spin here a little bit, then I'm gonna have you freeze this, Carolyn, in a, in a second or two. We're taking a bank turn here as we, uh, we started to collect some water in a couple of these tanks, which is really nice. And I'm going to have you, we're going to zoom in here and then right about now freeze it, pause. So this is awesome. So this is the big green slide. And by, um, um, I think by dimensions, this is now the biggest slide in Eugene. So the Amazon pool is now second rate. This is the big green slide. Uh, Jeff Perry and I already put on headlamps and took a slide in it. It seems it started filling up with water, so it works really well. I can guarantee that. Um, but this will be a big focus of the pool. But the, the reality is this focus is great, but the really big focus and the exciting part about this pool and the amenities is we're looking directly at the new maintenance facility or component. And on top of that is something called the big chiller or the chiller. And it's from Italy. And it is really the unique part of this pool. And um, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Jeff. All right. Thanks, Greg. Um, you know, those are some diehard tennis players I didn't notice playing out there uh, on the drone footage the first time around. I think it's raining, but, uh, you know, use of our facilities. Uh, so as Craig mentioned, um, that's, the, that's actually a heat pump that will um, heat and cool the pool if you want, but it's actually intended to, to heat the pool. And that's because um, we're, we're rolling out some new technology uh, for this project because uh, Echo Hollow is by far our biggest energy user. I probably mentioned this before, but I think it's almost, it's one and a half times the, um, the energy use compared to uh, even uh, Sheldon Pool, and so it's it's significant, and so there are really big opportunities for um, our project team to come up with some solutions to really help with uh, energy use. And so some of the things uh, for the project that we've been working on, um, you know, it's going to be LEED certified. 
Um, but in addition to that, we also are meeting uh, council climate recovery uh, goals where we're reducing our energy use and also our carbon footprint. And so the heat pump that's on the, the building over there will uh, move us away from the use of natural gas and a boiler system to an electrified uh, heat pump. And so that's a big deal. Um, it'll run uh, really low temps, it's super efficient. And it basically takes our carbon footprint almost to zero, which is, which is huge. It's a big dent in the work that we've been doing uh, over the years. We will still keep the boiler um, per eWeb's request. I mean, it actually worked out for really, really low temperatures. We'll have that as backup. But eWeb asks us uh, to keep that in place as well in case there's a, a brownout type of situation where they need us to go offline and uh, use our use our gas. And so there's a dual benefit to the to that system that's going to be in place. And so we're super excited about that, um, especially when the, the project's done and we can really see the actual use of that facility. Um, the other thing that you might have noticed is the drone flew over uh, the top of the, the larger part of the building, the natatorium. Um, there's a, a really large photovoltaic array, solar panels. And so we're required to apply uh, 1.5% of the construction budget toward uh, solar or some type of energy efficiency element. And so we actually took that 1.5% from Campbell, Sheldon, and Echo, put it all together and put it on this facility because it had, we're basically getting the best bang for our buck uh, with that system. And so that'll probably offset our energy use anywhere between five and 7%, but that's, uh, that's gonna be a big benefit going forward. Um, some of the uh, challenges, believe it or not, this project actually didn't have a lot of challenges. We thought there were gonna be um, some unknown conditions, and there were a few, but it's actually been uh, pretty smooth for a major uh, renovation of a relatively old facility and a pool, nonetheless. Um, we, uh, we have uh, COVID we're dealing with, and uh, the general contractor is working hard to keep uh, folks safe, but that's slowed uh, some of the work they can do concurrently. Um, that's one thing we've experienced, um, but we're working with them on that. Um, and also, we've had some kind of unusual things come up with the existing pool inside the building uh, where the slope wasn't um, to code uh, when it was built. And so we thought we could maybe get an exception, but um, it actually had two slopes. And uh, the state came back and said we needed to uh, meet that requirement. They were pretty adamant about it. So we had to go in and do some modifications and, and some change orders. But all in all, it's gone really well. Super happy with the team that's been, been on that. Um, just a fun, a fun fact, um, our design and construction manager, he's been with facilities for about two years, uh, Lauren Berry, his dad actually designed uh, Echo Hollow Pool back in the 60s. And so he was quite excited about the project and actually showed it to his dad here uh, a few months ago. And so that's kind of been a neat uh, family project, if you will. I'll hand it back over to you, Craig, if you want right. to talk about Sheldon a little. Um, sure, Karen, did you say you had any photos of this or is that of something else? Or I do. Okay, yeah, there's this, just go ahead and click through. There's the slide being put in. Here's the uh, solar panels. Yes, yeah. those are awesome. And here's uh, the gap between the indoor tank and the outdoor tank, making the bulkhead, sealing it up. And the next slide looks like a Campbell slide. It is. So okay. are you ready to move on to Campbell? Almost. Let me take two seconds and just mention that the other pool we have in the project, although we're not going to talk about it too much, we don't have any photos, is that the Sheldon pool is the second pool that got approved. And it's 100% design is complete and it's ready to go out for bid and, um, and ready to begin that process as this pool comes to an end. This pool is scheduled to be reopening in March. And the goal is, is when this one opens, Sheldon will close for construction. So we're having that overlap. And, we, and so with Sheldon, the design is not going to be as extensive as the design here. When we did public outreach for Sheldon Pool, we, we got a handful of folks that were traditional users, meaning that we had folks interested in 
deep water fitness or warm water fitness. And we had families that were interested in, in swim lessons and classes. And so Sheldon Pool and Design won't be an outdoor component. We're going to bump out a south wall, build a, a smaller warm water tank. And I think that's significant because of the population that uses the warm water tank. The warm water tank will be used for fitness in one part of the day, and the next part it'll turn into a, um, a current channel for children to play in. So it's a combination use. Um, but the fact that Tamarack Pool closed down, if people are familiar with Tamarack Pool as a health and fitness warm water facility, um, it may not ever open again. I will put more emphasis on the need to have a warm water pool at Sheldon. So Jeff, did you want to add any more else about, about Sheldon before we moved on? I, Craig, I think I would just uh, add, you know, we, when Sheldon uh, is under construction, we'll, it, we'll do that when uh, Echo's online. But at the same time, we intend to keep Amazon pool open uh, through the subsequent winter to, to maintain the aquatics access for everybody in the meantime. You bet. Um, we were ready to have Amazon open all through the winter until we just got closed down again for <laughs> tomorrow. So a little freeze on Amazon pool, which is kind of odd because it's an outdoor tank. But um, anyway, yeah, those, that's the status of our system of pools thus far. So we can move to the drone shot. If you want to Campbell, Carolyn, we can start talking about it. I'll start with a, a pod drone shot. Sure. Um, are, does the do board members have questions about Echo before we leave here? Good idea. OK, then we will go to Campbell. Oops, hold on. There you go. I'll talk a little bit and then you can <clears throat> wheel it in a little closer, but, uh, or you can, yeah, you can pause it right about now. So a Campbell again um, was a prioritized bond project, mainly because it's again, taking care of what we have as an older building. It was actually built in 1962 and then moved to this location in 1966. So it's been around a while and we have been woefully um, undersized in our service delivery to seniors and older adults. And that's what Campbell has been a prominent part of our community as. Um, this building historically in the last 15 to 20 years has been our busiest in recreation as far as the volume of people that go in and out of those, those, those doors. And so, um, it's good to have Campbell on this list of early bond projects to get it expanded and ready to go. So we also, um, we also talked to the users of Campbell and the design changes that they came up with were very similar to what we knew our staff said they needed in the sense of they wanted a gathering place for socialization in Campbell. They wanted more spaces for that. They wanted more fitness associated with the programming and this more space for that. And they also wanted simply more classrooms to do all the, the variety of things that go on at Campbell. There's a huge amount of programming that exists in this multi-room um, facility. It's actually our largest community center. But the, um, um, the addition essentially is a 6,000 square foot new wing. So um, go ahead and fly in closer, Carolyn, and um, we'll take a talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> We're coming in from the south, coming into the parking lot, slowly. Go ahead and pause right about there, Carolyn, that'd be great. <clears throat> pause right there, that'd be great. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's good. So perfect. essentially, uh, this is perfect. So essentially the original main entrance to Campbell in the old wing was through the south door. We just flew over the top of it. We're kind of hovering there. Um, the design change is now going to put the main entrance on the west side, which is kind of off to the left of this slide. Yeah, right in that area. That will be the main entrance. It's going to come in through the shop, which has been there forever as, as, as shop annexed, and, and go right into what I believe the construction company calls what is the stitch here between the new wing and the old wing. So 
What happened to the old wing as we expanded the lobby and moved the reception desk into a more centralized area and created more socialization place. So we took out a classroom in the old wing and we changed the lobby and put it close to that stitch so it'd be in the center of the building. The rest of the old wing essentially will be doing um, minor changes, uh, surface changes, carpets, painting, ceiling work, things like that. Um, the main budget pieces of this project went into the brand new wing. So um, go ahead and let it fly, Carolyn, and we'll talk about the, the, the new wing consists of four major components. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna fly around them here. One is an additional classroom on the south part of the new wing by the sticks. The second piece is a gender neutral, the first ever gender, gender neutral restroom system in our community centers, which would be great. Um, you can also see here that there's some, some, some significant landscaping going on around the outdoor camel because that's, um, it sits uniquely in the, this nice, beautiful Skinner Butte Park and it's one of our most significant rentals of any facility we own, and that's because it sits so nestled so nicely in our park. Um, as this drone drops down, you can see the what would be the northwest corner of the building, and that's going to zoom in toward a our fitness room, and that's phenomenal. That room with the, the glass windows is when you get a chance to tour it, it's gonna it's it's gorgeous. It's a really nice room, well designed, tons of light, looking down down at the river and down through the park. Um, this back side of the building is, a, is the hallway that runs the length of the new wing, and that's the exit at the end of the hallway. And then the, the room on its left is what we're going to be calling the Great Hall. And this is a multi-purpose room that can be divided into two sections, about the same size as the Baskin Tyson room in the library. So that'll be a huge um, addition to our, to our building. Um, and then the drone kind of elevates here looks at the surrounding grounds and the nice landscaping that's going to adjoin this building. And then it's going to take a peek at the apartments I want to live in when I'm about 85 years old, right there next to the river. Those are great apartments. Um, and then the rest of the uh, kind of Skinner Butte area in Yapoa. That's the flyby. I don't know where that left you, Jeff, and filling in where we're at with the, the rest of the, the system with Campbell. Uh, we have some photos, but go ahead and jump in. All right. So um, Campbell, similar to Echo Hollow, is a lead silver project. Um, and so we're excited about that. We're also um, focused on uh, climate recovery goals, uh, a little different system at Campbell. It's a, it's a building, it's not a pool. Um, the term and it's, it's actually called a VRF, uh, HVAC system that we're, we're replacing. And we're actually um, replacing the old system uh, in the existing building and, and adding a new one. And so from a efficiency standpoint and a comfort level standpoint, it's gonna be significantly better. Um, we're also adding uh, what we call direct digital controls to the project, which um, automate the HVAC uh, and lighting. And so it's pretty cool, especially in a LEED Silver certified building, um, it will, the, the system will actually monitor daylight. And when it gets too dark out, like it is right now, then it'll, it'll automatically turn the lights on to the appropriate lumen to, to create a consistent feel when you're in the facility. So it's pretty, pretty uh, high tech what we're doing. Um, super excited about it. One of the things um, that I was going to mention on the flyover too, we, um, we added uh, screening around the H HVAC system this time around. And, and those of you who have driven by that facility in the past, it had a really ugly, just steel uh, HVAC system all over the roof. Um, we had a lot of comments on that over the years. And so we're screening that. It's gonna look a lot better and it's gonna look a lot better, especially because it's in a park. And so we're excited about some of the aesthetics with project as well. Um, Campbell surprisingly has been one of the more challenging projects of the, the three that we've been working on uh, just because of uh, several conditions. We ran into uh, contaminated soil, which was a major factor during excavation. 
Um, we also were required to add a fire hydrant, a water line in because of the fire suppression system um, that's going into the new facility. And uh, another piece of it too is it's actually the, the existing facilities facility was I think three structures kind of shoved together and, and uh, constructed together. And so when you start pulling that apart and you start doing renovations, you really run into, we'll just call it opportunities to make improvements uh, from a, an aesthetic standpoint and just a structural standpoint. But the project team has done an excellent job. They've, they've done a lot of work. They had to value engineer, uh, change the scope early on to really bring it within budget. And they've done that. And um, it's going to be a really successful project. So we're super excited. Um, one of the things I should have mentioned on the ECHO project too is um, the fact that we're moving away from natural gas on uh, this project and the ECHO project um, provided some opportunities to apply for rebates with eWeb. And so we got over $100,000 in rebates from eWeb for that system. And we're getting, it's, it's I can't remember the amount, it's quite a bit less, but we're, we're getting a, a rebate for the Campbell project as well, which is great. It helps us move those projects forward and, uh, you know, help Add, add amenities and, and do some of the uh, things that we're hoping to do with the project. Um, the timeline for Campbell is uh, basically opening up the beginning of the, the, the calendar year. We'll be done right around then, probably at the end of this year, but the, the game plan at the moment is to open that up in January. You know, COVID aside, we'll keep our fingers crossed. So anything else you can think of, uh, Craig, that you'd like me to touch on as far as project? That's good. The, the staff that are working there now look at it and they just they just love what's going on there and they're just anxious to get to work in it. Um, this is a shot of the hallway, I believe, in the new wing. Extra wide for wheelchairs and walkers. Yeah. Any questions about Campbell? Hey. Okay, um, I think I will turn my um, controls over to Emily, who is going to take us over to the downtown Riverfront Park. So, Thanks, Carolyn. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give this a shot and see if I can share my screen. Oh, goody. Okay, mm -hmm. here we go. Let me give this a try. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Uh, can you see that? Uh, can everybody see my slide, my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, outstanding. Okay, um, we're gonna start from the beginning. Okay, so um, I think I came to you a year, a year ago, maybe, or maybe longer ago um, to talk about the Downtown Riverfront Park project. And I think I gave you a pretty good history at the time. But um, so today, I think I'll just give you a, a brief historical update. And then um, I have some slides and uh, and then a drone video kind of in the middle and then some slides afterwards. Um, and the slide format I thought I'd share with you, we have a lot of drawings and um, the way that the the way that the site is starting to come together is really um, easily comparable to the drawing. So it's kind of a fun um, comparison of, of where we are now and where, we, where we're envisioning. So uh, I'll, just, I'll just get started here. Um, so uh, the Downtown Riverfront Park project is of course, um, you know, uh, sort of the very initial work on our Downtown Riverfront 17 acre Downtown Redevelopment site. Um, so again, formerly uh, where eWeb Operations was and they moved out to their Roosevelt Operations Center. Um, they've been doing so in phases over the last eight years or so. Um, so it's about a 17 acre downtown redevelopment site. It'll have housing, hotel, some retail, a restaurant. Um, also this, I can see, can you see my cursor? There's this steam plant renovation here. Um, and so, 
It also has our three acre um, riverfront park, which is from here to here. And actually the um, park improvements actually extend all the way down to the interface with the U of O North Campus property because we're renovating the bike path in this section as well. And then um, all the way up to the Peter DeFazio bridge up here. And then uh, we also have a one acre public plaza. And so I'll talk about the phasing of that shortly. So for construction this year uh, on the site, we've been focused on the construction of the downtown riverfront park and then phase one of the infrastructure. So all of the, um, you know, pipes and uh, utilities and um, streets and lighting and all the things that you know go into providing uh, build ready lots uh, in a new neighborhood and so the phase one is in this light yellow here and then um, phase two of this infrastructure is planned to begin next year uh, pending funding approval from city council so um, and then as buildings come in i think we'll you'll see buildings starting to develop um, at uh, lots nine and seven, and then um, uh, and then moving north into the into the into the threes. So um, that's a super quick overview of what's happening on the downtown riverfront right now. Um, if anyone's driven by over the Ferry Street Bridge, you can see all kinds of machinery and dirt and all the things. Um, so I'm excited to give you a little bit of a more of a, a closer tour because it's hard to see. Um, so, uh, as a brief reminder, this is our park design that we um, developed over uh, the 2018, over 2018. So we hired Walker Macy Landscape Architects um, in very early of 2018 and went back out to the public to reconfirm our park design um, details. Um, there have been quite a bit of conversation about the nature of the park design and the master planning process for the riverfront years ago, but um, having, you know, a clear park design that um, reflected current, uh, a more current and uh, public desire was really important. So um, effectively, the center of the park is here. Um, and I think when I talked to you last, we had uh, been doing some construction work to move dirt around and, but uh, a brief overview of the design is that um, really the center and the entrance of the park is here at Fifth Avenue. Um, we also have then um, entrances here at Wiley Griffin Way and then also here at Naknek Avenue. So the idea of the park was and the redevelopment was to bring the city to the river and the river to the city. And so these view corridors are part of that. The stormwater treatment systems within those um, street uh, paving types and stormwater treatment within there is all meant to really bring forward that idea. Um, so we have several overlooks here at Fifth Avenue. We have one, a south overlook here. And then between those, um, we laid the bank back, so made it less steep through this section here. Um, and so uh, in addition to the big bike path, there'll also be a walking section of the path and then a more uh, a, more narrow path that comes out closer to the river that you can follow like this. Um, we'll have outdoor seating areas. We'll keep the eWeb Riverfront uh, Plaza pretty much as is. And then we're making some significant improvements at the north end to provide uh, ADA access up this ramp up to the top of the Peter DeFazio Bridge. Right now you have to come all the way over here and all the way back. And this area has also been pretty um, hard for our um, park operations staff to maintain over the years. And so this will really formalize um, that section of the park. So that's a quick overview. Uh, and everything in the park project that we're working on now is uh, between the path and the river. The plaza is this phase two area here. And for now, it will just be grass, a path, and some lighting and a few benches. So this is a quick um, photographic uh, chronological. They're not perfectly from the same vantage points, but this is the site in 2018 with still a lot of the eWeb buildings on it. Uh, in 2019, we took away all of the buildings <laughs> um, and started to, um, we built this hall road. So you can see that connection to Fifth Avenue now right here. And then uh, we also laid the bank back. So you can see here where contractors are putting down fabric and armoring the bank with this, um, with this riprap. And here we are now in 2020. And so this is a little bit of a different angle, but that Fifth Avenue overlook is here. 
and that's Fifth Avenue heading back into the city. There's the stormwater planters, um, and then this is our deck uh, structures that are coming along. So um, this is where we'll start to see a little bit of our vision and reality. Um, so again, this is like a drone view, um, uh, but an illustrative drone view. So of basically the phase one construction of the park. So here's the Fifth Avenue Overlook. Uh, you may remember we have this big art piece here. Um, it's a it's an art pavilion with um, highly polished steel ribbons on it that are reflective of the um, contours under the river in this area. Um, and then this is the Fifth Avenue Overlook, the bike path. Um, this is our deck overlook here and the river walk. Um, and always, if you can remember to look at the tower, that's kind of an anchoring point for you if, as we're going through this tour. Um, and so here's a, a view that's fairly similar, not completely similar, but you're starting to see the construction of this wall and eventually that path will go this way. Um, and then this curving set of structures. So this will be the deck, this will be, you know, Fifth Avenue and the Fifth Avenue overlook and our beautiful river. Uh, this is a view looking south um, with you know, future buildings in mind. Um, this is a restaurant, this is multifamily housing. Again, I, um, and this is also multifamily housing and we think that these lots will, th this lot and this lot will likely develop first. Um, and so then there's a view kind of looking back the other direction. So you can really see the curvatures of the design uh, coming into play here, and then also the future bike path arching through right here. Um, and this is the video, so I'll just I'll just narrate a little bit as we go through the video. Um, before we start, I thought I'd uh, mention this is um, this is Annie Mims Way back here. It parallels the railroad tracks. So again, we're looking back toward the viaduct, and this is Ferry Street here, and then Fifth. So let's go. Um, and so uh, we're flying south along the site here, um, past the structure that will uh, host these overlooks. The overlooks will extend about six to eight feet beyond the walls. Um, and so then now you're looking across the development. Uh, we have a lot of spare dirt that is being stockpiled. This is the south overlook here. I'll just stop there for a second. Um, and again, this south overlook will extend six to eight feet beyond this um, structure. Um, and then we'll get a good look here at the steam plant. And um, this will also eventually be an overlook uh, structure as well, if, we, if the visions come to be. Um, so again, heading south here, you can see across the city, it's really cool. These are beautiful drone flights shot by our own um, Paul Gordon. He's been doing a phenomenal job and I think he did the ones for the buildings as well. Um, so getting a better look at the overall site, you can see uh, Ferry Street coming in over here and now we'll tip. Um, look at the river here. It is so stunning. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and when you're out on these overlooks, you can get the, because this is where the river curves, you can really get beautiful views up and down the river. So you can see down to the Ferry Street and the Fazio Bridge and then up to the Fraunmeyer Bridge as well. Um, that area where we're working up here to create those new ramps is right up here. It won't go that far, but um, so heading back toward the EWEB headquarters um, and the future bike path, which is here. Um, and then zooming out a little bit more over the development. So this is um, this is lot nine. No, this is the plaza actually. So this it's looking over this fenced area where we're staging everything is the plaza, and then the future restaurant site is here. Um, and so now it will float around um, and look sort of facing out toward the river, so you can start to get an idea of what that kind of feels like on site. Um, being on the ground there is truly remarkable. Um, it's such a transformation. It's it's hard not to be super, super excited about it. I love this little machinery digging dirt in this video. Uh, <laughs> but you can see these stormwater planters here and then all here along Fifth Avenue. And this is the end of the, toward the end of the video here where you're starting, oh, I'm so sorry. Back. Oh. Hang on, we'll start here. Um, and you're just starting to get a vision of what it's gonna be like you know, there at the edge of the river on a sunny day. Um, this should be 
really quite well. Thank you. And views across Dalton Baker, of course, and up the river. I just have to pause there because it's so beautiful. Okay. Um, so in addition to, you know, um, just this sort of really big construction work we're doing, we'll also be implementing these art, uh, interpretive art pieces. And I think I may have spoken with you about these before, um, but these are the, um, this is the interpretive piece. The ring is an interpretive piece about the steam plant. This, um, these sort of uh, ripples of water uh, with interpretive panels on the wall are, um, meant to talk about the braided river. And then this third piece here is our cultural piece, which is interprets um, African American experience in Eugene in very early days, particularly when they couldn't live within the city limits. And so this talks about the across the bridge community. Um, and so we have recently gotten samples of this work. So this work is going to be um, cast by uh, Steve Reinmuth um, of Reinmuth. Uh, at the Rhinemouth Bronze Foundry. Um, and the cool thing about Steve Rhinemouth is, is that he grew up when, when he was growing up, his dad worked in the steam plant for like his entire life. So that's my cool story about, um, about people who have connections to the site that go way back. Um, so these are some of the interpretive pieces. This is uh, a sample of um, a piece about our watershed. And the, these are samples of um, the, in, the ring uh, that interprets the steam plant. And there'll be light and steam that comes out of these grates. These are half size. So, but we're looking at different patinas and different shininesses and all kinds of things. Um, but I love these samples. I think they're really beautiful. And so here's a, uh, you know, a view looking south up river um, with these shade structures, which will be coming in probably fairly late in the game. And this is a stormwater treatment plant, right? A stormwater treatment planter right here. And now you can see that coming to reality. So um, this is the wall for the stormwater planter right here. This will be the walk that wraps around like that. And then these are the um, foundation walls for the deck that this shot is so beautiful. So much of the work that's happening on this site is happening really early in the morning. Um, and so the sunrise shots of all these people finishing concrete is um, pretty awesome. I'll give Spencer Crawford uh, credit here for that. Um, and then um, these are just various photos actually of people working on the site. And I think it's, um, the reason I'm showing these is because the number of jobs that we've been able to keep for local people um, by being able to continue this work through COVID is, um, well, between the design teams and the construction teams, you know, even if it not, might not be full-time work, it is hundreds of people um, who have touched this project. Um, employees across the city, employees with bound contracting and all of their subcontractors um, and employees um, at Walker Macy with all of their subcontractors as well. Um, and I'm so grateful um, that we were able um, and allowed to continue to do this work even during COVID. I think um, to Matt Rodriguez's credit, uh, it was just really awesome to see the city um, really step up and say, hey, we have a responsibility and an employment role here and we, we want to continue this. So it's been really exciting. It's been able to, you know, we didn't really pause in our work. We've been able to continue forward and that's been really exciting. Um, and then this is looking back uh, up um, toward the uh, eWeb headquarters along this beautiful curving wall. Um, it is stunning wall. I just want to say, you know, I can't say enough about good concrete, and this is exceptional, really beautiful concrete. Um, and then this is also looking north. It's a little further south than the wall, but um, this is what it'll look like, I think, within six months, and we hope to open in um, June or July of this year. So there's a ton going on. It's extremely exciting, um, and I'm so grateful again to, you know, be one of the leads on this project in collaboration with so many others. Any questions? I'm going to jump in for a question if I could. Sure. And, and this is for you, Emily, or I guess uh, for Craig, um, and on any of the projects, uh, material costs. I don't, I don't know how you guys bid the work, but you know, if you talk to anybody just building a house, cost of lumber, cost of plywood, cost of everything has gone up dramatically in the last year. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, are you guys seeing an impact from that? Wow, you know, I don't, I don't know that we have. We put this project out for bid on Christmas Eve in 2019. Um, and we opened bids on February 24th. And admittedly, this was all before COVID, but we were definitely starting to see, um, we were seeing price increases already, uh, largely because of, I think, um, sort of trade issues between, uh, you know, China or other places where, you know, the current administration, um, I think, was, was making, creating some clear boundaries around that. Um, and so it was affecting prices, but it was sort of vol volatile, sort of, and then supply chains. But I think, like, I don't know how, you know, that probably has changed over COVID because we have supply gaps, but, um, but there was sort of a pre-COVID condition as well that I think was creating those inflationary moments. So I, I don't know how much it's changed during COVID, but they haven't asked me for any extra money. So <laughs> as far as materials and supplies go, I don't know how it is on the, um, on the facility side. Jeff, have you seen anything? Um, I think you hit it on the head with the volatility piece because yeah. we, pre-COVID, we had uh, Echo Hollow come in substantially lower than our budget and uh, Campbell came in over. And no, just, you know, no, no frame of reason, just competition and who was available. So availability mm -hmm. of contractors is a big factor. Um, we have heard, we, we were kind of optimistic that bid prices might, um, start coming down construction prices because of, you know, less projects out there and seeing more competition. But we've heard just anecdotally that because of COVID, it's, it's increasing costs for contractors. And so they have to take more safety precautions and it's taking more time to yeah. complete jobs and things like that. So it, at the moment, it doesn't look like we're seeing any kind of reprieve from the inflation we've been experiencing. But, you know, six months from now, it can be a totally different story. I will say, keep your fingers crossed because we do have the Sheldon bid come in in about a month and we're all holding our breath, hoping that it's competitive like the, the last one we did. So. And I'll say that the difference between kind of our project is we're mostly working outside. Um, but having said that, like, I've been pretty insistent, like I'm very, I'm usually pretty hands off about, um, how people run their job sites from a safety standpoint, but with COVID um, and in this project, like, you know, we had people working right next to each other on 15 foot high walls. And I actually mandated a mask, I, I, I created a mask mandate um, for, for people working on the job site, um, I think well before <laughs> um, anybody else sort of got there, but I, I just saw people working really close together and I was really concerned for their safety and for their ability, you know, I just didn't want COVID to shut down their job. You know, I wanted them to, I wanted Brown Contracting to, to continue to be able to work. So it has been, I would say a hassle, but I think it's less, um, less impactful, I think on, on outdoor projects, probably than building projects. Craig Smith, I think you want to say something. No. Just got fingers crossed for the Sheldon Pool bid. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think, I think I think I would credit our construction crews, both at Campbell and at Echo, for doing well within the COVID environment. Yeah, there have been some cases on our job site, and they've managed to, you know, identify it early and, you know, get people quarantined and got them well and came back to work. So, um, any other questions? questions? Thanks for uh, having me. It's a really, I can't wait for y'all to come out and check it out. Thank you, Emily and Craig you, Emily. and Jeff. Great tours. Um, okay, well, now uh, we're gonna move on to the report review. Um, so hopefully you all had a chance to look over that and uh, make any notes. I think I will share my screen again and just kind of walk, walk through it and um, point out the highlights and then answer any questions or, or take any um, edits you might have into consideration. And, um, so I'll start off and then I believe um, Chris Gerard and Kelly Shadwick are gonna jump in once we get to the levy. 
So um, here we go again with screen sharing. Um, you all seen this? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see. I'll just, you will notice that it follows the same format as it did last year. So um, we start with the kind of Dear Eugene letter from Craig and Craig um, as an introduction, kind of summarizing the interesting year we've had. Um, and then, um, but yeah, if you look at the table of contents, it does really closely follow the format from last year. We, we actually were really pleased with the report last year. We felt like it was kind of easy to read, informative, you know, um, why, why mess with it, right? And so um, we start with just some introductory information and then we move into specific um, updates around the bond and then the financial information. And then the same with the levy um, updates about progress on the levy and then some of the finances. And, and you will recall that actually the, um, this is based on the fiscal year and really the main point uh, or the requirement, I guess, that we have in this report is to report on the expenditures in order to show transparency that we are spending the money the way that we said we would. So um, I'll just um, jump through here a little bit. There will be a little piece about uh, the citizen advisory board, but we will, um, our, our thinking is that we will update that photo with a screenshot from tonight's meeting. Um, and then we get into the bond report and we start the bond report with the actual language from the ballot measure. Um, that is what we said we would do and that's what we want to hold ourselves to. Um, and the ballot actually uh, refers to the city council resolution. So that's included as well. And basically it just outlines these specific projects that um, we uh, are funding with the bond measure. Uh, so I'll just go to two page real quick here. Um, this is uh, the page that kind of shows the uh, geographic distribution of all of our projects, the different types of projects. And then on the right hand side, we have kind of the at a glance project status. And so it shows um, it shows each one of the projects and at what phase um, they're in. Not all are started, but a majority of them are. We're um, pretty happy about that. And then you'll see there's three check marks and those mark the projects that are completed. And then the final um, column shows the expected completion date for each um, of those projects. Um, and then the next pages just kind of actually go into a little bit more detail about the project status. So this is just a great opportunity for us to tell people what's going on. And so we, um, we have categorized the projects into the different um, uh, status of completion. So our three projects that are complete are um, the four artificial turf fields, which we did in conjunction with 4J and Bethel School District, and um, the Tugman Park Playground, which is actually phase one of Tugman Park. We still have a phase two coming up. And then Amazon Park Running Trail, which actually is just um, so freshly finished that we haven't even taken the fences down, but those uh, are coming down on Thursday and we know people are lining up, ready to uh, get back on that trail. So we're, we're happy that we have those three completed. And then we talk about the projects that are under construction and really that are very close to completion um, that will be complete in 2021. Campbell Community Center and Echo Hollow, as you just heard, in addition, the Downtown Riverfront Park um, and that also a lighting project that um, is, has started, um, which is along the West Bank path. And so um, those are all well um, underway. 
And then we have the construction projects that are going to start up um, in uh, 2021. And there's a lot of them. 2021 is going to be a big construction year for us. 2020 was a big construction year, but as far as um, the number of projects that will get underway in 2021, it's, it's really striking. Um, we have uh, habitat restoration along the Amazon Creek, where you see that image there in the corner. Hopefully it's not too small for you, but um, that's the concrete line channel between 24th and, and 19th, and that is going to be removed. And we're going to return that part of the Amazon channel to a more natural um, uh, um, sloped uh, creek. So that's exciting. That'll be a two-year project. And then we have um, renovation at Berkeley Park. You guys, I think we took you guys to Berkeley Park when we were first doing, doing the planning there. Uh, we'll be renovating the tennis courts at Churchill High School. Uh, we will be um, completing our looped path at Delta Ponds, which involves uh, building a bridge over the Dedrick Slough, which is um, a pretty big project. We have more lighting projects going on um, in uh, Alton Baker Park, specifically Prees Trail. All those lights will be replaced along the South Bank um, path, basically between the Riverfront Park and the Frommeyer Bridge on the U of O property. And Monroe Park, which is one of our neighborhood parks, which um, we're so grateful that we budgeted for some neighborhood park lighting replacement because that park's lighting system is just literally failing. And um, so we have kind of bumped that one up in priority and we're, we think we're gonna be able to get that constructed next year. Um, of course, Sheldon Pool and Fitness Center that you heard a little bit about. Uh, Striker Field, which is a um, big eight acre. It's gonna be a big project in uh, Northeast Eugene. Um, all these things are gonna be happening next year. so. It's really exciting. And then we talk a little bit about what's coming up. Basically what is in the planning stages right now. And that is the um, phase one of a community park for Santa Clara and uh, Suzanne Arley Ridgeline Trail and Access. So more exciting projects. Um, we, we pulled out the habitat restoration work because we do have a, a number of projects related to habitat restoration and they're just a little bit different than a construction project. Um, and what I love about these projects is a little bit of money goes a really long way. Um, but really what we do with that money is we focus on removing invasives and um, letting the native plants kind of come there. Are a lot of these places still have that native seed bank out there. We just need to remove the invasives and let the natives come back. Um, and we do some planting of natives as well. But we tend to do it in like um, two to three consecutive years. So it's not like you just go in, remove the invasives and you walk away. You go and you remove the invasives, you walk away and then you come back and then you walk away and then you come back and you do that for about three years in a row and generally that um, does uh, hold. And so, so that's um, kind of the project status. Um, and I'll just keep talking a little bit more here about the expenditures and then I'll pause for questions and then we'll move to the levy. Um, so- uh, Carla, Carla, could you just make it a little bit bigger? You bet, why don't I, Thank you, Kelly. I will take it off of that. Um, that's a little too big. So um, we are doing a lot to leverage our funds. Um, so the bond measure uh, provides about $39 million in, in, in funds. And we, through matching funds, are contributing another 40 million. So basically we're doubling the amount of money coming in um, through this bond measure. We're doing that through kind of internal funding sources. The majority comes from that. 
That includes our Parks and Recreation um, SDCs, which stands for System Development Charges, um, which is our, our other primary funding source for park projects, parks and recreation projects. Um, also a significant amount of money coming from urban renewal, specifically for the downtown riverfront park. Um, we also have stormwater capital, um, uh, transportation funds, and all of that really speaks to the fact that we do really collaborate really well as a city when we see projects that have multiple benefits. We're, we're you know, willing to chip in from a variety of different funding pools to make these really good projects happen. And um, so I think it really speaks to the, um, the multiple, multiple benefits of a lot of these projects. And then there's external funding sources. So we have had one successful grant application so far, $350,000 um, from Oregon State Parks, which is going to the Delta Ponds Bridge Project. And we will be applying for more grants as, as we go. So um, then we have a million dollars in partner funding from the school districts. That's for the, um, for the turf fields that have already been constructed. And then we'll actively be seeking donations um, from just private, um, private entities. And the first one that we're really working on right now is to accompany the Amazon running trail. And that is to replace some of the um, stretching equipment that was really outdated and just didn't have it in the budget, but we're hoping to, um, to be able to um, add some new equipment there with uh, maybe some sponsorships even. So um, the, now here comes the funding piece the fun funding piece. And this is very similar to what we did last year. So we broke it down first by expense categories. So these are the types of things that we spend money on. Materials and supplies, which is actually kind of a catch-all. Um, contractual services, personnel expenses, construction expenses, um, utilities, and then bond issuance costs. And what we wanted to do was be cumulative. So we wanted to focus on FY20, but also build on what we've already done. So we included um, the spending um, from our FY19 here, but then this kind of center area is really about what we're reporting on in this particular report, which is what we spent in FY20, which ended um, June 31st of this year um, in the bond, bond category, our other category of funding, which I just kind of described, and then total spending, and then we have total spending to date. So you can see that we've actually um, spent a lot of money this year. We were at 3.8 million at the end of last year, and now we're at um, $15.3 million expenditures. Um, the next page then just breaks it down by project. And so um, you'll see we have the same um, dollar amounts at the bottom, but it's just another way of slicing it to, um, to look at what we did. Let me just make this a little smaller. Um, so again, while well, these first columns right here talk about what the project budget is, both the total project budget and then specifically what is being funded through the bond measure, um, we wanted to pull forward the information from last year's report for FY19 total expenses. And then we break down the expenditures based on um, bond fund, other funding, and then the total costs for FY20. And then, then again, um, showing the total uh, project dollars spent to date. And so we've done this for every project that has spent money you won't see all of the projects that have not been started yet or haven't incurred any expenses yet. Um, you know, and again, this is for FY20. And so if we've started a project in July moving forward, um, you, won't, you won't see those expenses here. You'll see those um, in next year's report. So um, with that, I think I will pause and um, see if uh, anyone has any questions.
And now I can see people. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes. Okay, this is Scott. Just a quick question. Yep. On, so this, that's the, I think I answered my own question, but like we're looking at Echo Hollow, Echo Hollow Pool. Yeah. It says total spending of 4.3, but this is only through June, right? Because that's considerably less, even though we're getting close, that number's only through June. So, um, again, are we kind of anticipating when this thing wraps up that we'll be close to the budget of um, that 12.2? Yes, we are. And so you're right the the reason we're not seeing more money, we have spent more money there, but we're just not reporting on, on FY21 yet. Okay. Um, but I, I guess I'll just, um, Jeff, I'm, it's my understanding we are on budget for that project. You can speak up if we're not. We're on budget, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even slightly below budget. Well. Impressive. Molly. Yes, I have a question. Um, we talked about how um, Echo Hollow started um, before COVID and before supply chain disruptions and how Campbell um, Community Center, you know, was, was an indoor build, a lot more COVID restri restrictions or, or protocols. Um, when these projects are going to come in over or under budget, will we see that? I mean, when when will we be able to take a look at at those budgets, or how the how the changing atmosphere or changing um, parameters are impacting these budgets? I I guess the way we would describe that. So we aren't going to move forward with a project and come in over budget once we've established the contract. You know, we're gonna, I mean, there's change orders and things that we elect to do. Sometimes they're harder, but we, so for instance, Campbell uh, Community Center, the bids came in pretty high on that one. <clears throat> and so we met with our, our recreation colleagues, uh, the architect and the general contractor on that project and went through what we call a value engineering process where we, we looked at the footprint, we looked at the amenities, we did everything we had to do to bring it within budget. And that's what we signed a contract with uh, McKinsey Commercial, <clears throat> excuse me, to move forward with. So, you know, if it if we had a bid come in wildly over what we projected, that might be a different story. But we're, we go through these processes with our design team and we get estimates probably every couple of months. And so with Sheldon, we know we're, we're really going to be close um, with our estimates. Um, we also felt we were really close with Echo Hollow, and then they came in um, quite a bit lower, which allowed us to do more on that project. Um, one of the things that we do know with, um, with uh, Sheldon is that, that there are, we're seeing prices come in a little bit higher. So instead of putting everything all in one bid, we're asking for alternates also. So there's a couple of things that we'll ask for, um, like the roof replacement. That's a good example. Um, that's actually something we were planning on doing in facilities. So we may leverage some of our uh, capital dollars to do that repair because it would be appropriate. Um, but we're gonna see what the bids look like. And if we need to have that conversation, we'll do it. But it's, a, it's really about an exercise more so than um, coming to the end of it and being over budget. We're, we're, we watch that stuff really close when we go through those processes. I do think that um, people would be interested a little bit more. So for example, under your complete section on page 10, I think it's great if you're under budget and you should tout that and say this actually came in under budget or you know right on budget or right on target um, as much as possible. I think you're right. So as we as we get to the end of some of these these construction projects, we'll be able to kind of have that look back and and yeah tout our successes and. Um, on the park side of things, as Jeff was saying, we, we also kind of build to the budget. And so if we think that, um, you know, bids are maybe are gonna come in high on a park project, we'll have some alternates. And so maybe we need to dial back on some of the things that we wanna build 
Um, or uh, maybe we can, you know, find some money somewhere else through a grant or something like that. Um, but typically we're, um, we know what we're getting into once we get those bids. And so um, we have that safeguard from going over budget. Any other thoughts or questions before we move on to the levy? All right. I just want to uh, say that since we met last, it's amazing how much you guys have gotten done. And the projects, I mean, it, it looks great. It's amazing. I'm, I'm so impressed with uh, how much you guys have done because Tell you the truth, I thought with COVID that everything had slowed down, and and I haven't been out as much, so I haven't seen it, and and just wanted to add that. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. We feel pretty good about that too. <laughs> Can I say one more thing? Yes. Um, on page, let's see, page fifteen under leveraging bond funds, where it says donations are being or will be sought. I think that you should add a link. Maybe someone will be inspired to give <laughs> once they see all the work being done and uh, people can, you know, go there and see all their options for donating. But I think that's an opportunity for you're saying you're going to ask people. Why not just put it there and see what people do? Excellent. <laughs> yes, give them all opportunities to give us money. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I would I would add to that um, a lot of what Emily said about keeping jobs, creating jobs through this really difficult um, period. You think we should tout that a little bit more? I do, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to let Scott know that I just ran a really quick high level query on that one project and we have spent 2.2 million since July 1st. So it's moving along. <laughs> That's the benefit of actually sitting at your computer during a meeting like this. You can look up information that you wouldn't be able to if you're sitting in a conference room somewhere. It's like professional sports. So we, we commentate and then somebody pulls up the analytics on the back end and we get to act like we know something because they did the work, right? Yeah. <laughs> well done, Cinnamon. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay. We're going to move on and talk about the levy. And so I'm going to share my screen again and turn over commentary to uh, Chris and Kelly. Can you guys see that? Yes. All right. Uh, well, good afternoon, early evening, everyone. Um, what an exciting group of projects. So, um, uh, I mean, not only as an employee, but as a citizen, I can't wait, you know, to go to the Riverfront Park system and the pools and things like that. So, uh, uh, how exciting. So, let's talk about the exciting levy, though, in FY20 as well. So, we did some exciting things. Um, FY20. The let's go to the levy status page. Uh, how about the next one up? Uh, nope, next one down. So, Carolyn, Carolyn, can you make it bigger again? Sorry, you got am I on the right page? Uh, page 18, if you can get there. Ah, page 18. Yeah, oh, there we go. And so, um, we'll get this figured out as we move along. So FY20 was very much built on the back of FY19. So FY19 was a heavy lifting year of uh, ordering equipment, purchasing equipment, hiring staff, and just getting ramped up to provide the services that we promised to the community, which was um, you know, improve park safety and improve maintenance, improve trails, natural areas, and we opened closed restrooms and uh, things of that nature. So. Definitely, um, you know, 
uh, FY20 is where I feel like we really started to hit our, uh, our stride. And as the caption below the uh, now um, much more developed uh, Riverfront Park System site says, um, the way that the levy is designed is that spending the levy funds is definitely weighted more heavily as these parks get built out and we spend more money to maintain them. And so the levy will really hit its stride when um, you know, we move staff on site to maintain some of these areas. And you know, it's exciting to see that we're well on the way. I mean, we've hired uh, most of the staff on the maintenance side to get ready for this. We need to do that so we have staff that's fully trained and ready to go from day one that these facilities open. So how about rolling to the next slide? But uh, FY20 also threw some interesting curveballs, but gave us some excellent opportunities. And the levy really set us up really well to deal with our COVID-19 response. Um, if you do some research on Google data, our park usage just skyrocketed during the um, first COVID shutdown. Um, if I'm correct, um, some of the data was showing that we had um, an uptick in park usage in Lane County, which includes the city of Eugene of well over to 125 to like a, up in the 140% range. And you can see that that led to us, um, you know, being forced to, uh, you know, to deal with that, which our levy helped out a lot by providing additional staff members and things like that, which wasn't easy at times during COVID. But um, everybody, you know, it was all hands on deck and everybody did their part and we did a really good job. One of the things that the levy also helped us uh, respond to was during the shutdown of COVID, we had a, a um, we weren't enforcing our camping ban in parks. And so we had a large amount of uh, camping activity going. And so when we came out of that, our illicit activities team and park ambassadors and other park staff were really helpful in, um, you know, getting us back to, uh, you know, what I would say more of a baseline on our camping situation. And so they did a ton of work in cleaning up camps along the riverbank and on our developed park system. So, so with that, uh, next slide, please. I feel a little about a little like Craig Smith on the drone flight. So, uh, so projects completed and ongoing. So I talked a little about park safety. Um, so we hired two dedicated uh, Eugene Park resource officers um, to increase park safety, and then two full-time and two seasonal park ambassadors, which is a great program. I mean, and Kelly will talk about it in a minute from our uh, survey that we did and the results of the efforts of increasing uh, park safety to the levy. And then we also have a partner with DPI Security that, um, you know, really puts eyes on the parks uh, when our other staff isn't there like the middle of the night and early morning and that's made a big difference. And then our new illicit activities team remains um, clearly focused on picking up, um, you know, items from illicit activities. In fact, you can look at the photo and that's one of our staff members cleaning up uh, an illegal camp. And, you know, we really just can't have these type of situations along our riverbank quarters and our parks. So they made a, just a tremendous difference. And then uh, rolling up to uh, develop park maintenance, um, we continue to offer six restrooms that were previously closed to the community. Um, due to the levy, we were able to open those up. And that, that's made a huge difference for people. Um, I think everybody here knows how important restrooms are to our community. And then we increased uh, litter and trash pickups and um, increased our uh, restroom cleaning um, uh, frequency as well. And then we hired four seasonal uh, positions in a swing shift um, role where they visited our most busy park corridors, such as the riverfront and the Amazon and the uh, Amazon uh, corridor. And that made a just a tremendous difference for people not only out later in, at night in the summertime, but as well as the staff when they came to work the next morning that things were much ready to go. And so and then we also uh, increased turf health through the park system and by uh, aeration, overseeding, proper watering and fertilizer application. And then we also uh, upped our mowing by 10%, which you know is much better for people who go to their playground and play on the turf and things like that. And then one thing that we 
did as well, which was also a goal in uh, APWA accreditation is we completed our parks tree inventory and we're using that right now to assign printing jobs in uh, areas around playgrounds and pathways and things like that. So we were able to um, you know, complete two things at once and increase safety for the community. So moving on. Um, natural area, uh, trail and natural area maintenance is a big component of our park system. I mean, the Ridgeline Trail is super popular. Anybody who likes up on the Butte can probably see that on, you know, most sunny days. But uh, contractors and staff um, really did a good job and resurfaced or removed vegetation from close to 20 miles of the trail system. And, you know, it made a, a big difference, the resurfacing, especially during times like today, where people can still get out and use the trail system and, you know, reduce the muddy conditions. And then we also did a significant amount of work to eliminate uh, tree hazards and reduce wildfire risk in our natural areas. So along our port border edges, where we've had some uh, tree dieback due to uh, drought um, and things like that, we were able to uh, mitigate that risk. And, you know, I think everybody knows how important that work is with the fire season that we had this year. And so, you know, it, it may be a work that a lot of people don't see, but it's vastly important that it gets done. And then just the maintenance of roads and the parking areas and the signage and things of that nature. So when you get to the site, um, we've done a lot of work there um, as far as, you know, just maintaining those areas so they look nicer. And then what's really important is custodial service to those areas that really didn't have a steady custodial presence before the levy. So that's made a big difference in overall experience of people getting to the trail systems and things like that. They're much cleaner. Oh, and the portable toilets, yes. That were added, highly important. Very popular. Yes, very popular. So looking forward, as I mentioned early on, um, the spending of levy funds is definitely weighted more in the uh, final years of this levy. Um, so we're definitely preparing to take on additional work. Um, I mentioned the downtown river Front Park. We have um, Stryker Field, which is soon to be renamed. We have uh, some work going on at Santa Clara Community Park. And we've hired um, two uh, long-term duration employees to help with future park maintenance. And that will be really important once these parks come online that we're able to um, provide the services that the uh, community expects. And then we're also going to do some more uh, hazard tree mitigation and we've added uh, park furnishing and picnic tables um, up on the trail system and through our park system. That was one of the things that was mentioned, um, you know, in some survey work is that people wanted to see um, additional picnic tables and benches and trash cans. And we've certainly delivered on that in FY20. So let's talk a little about the expense categories. Um, so Materials and supplies, as Carolyn mentioned, you know, that's kind of a catch-all thing that allows us to operate our system. And then uh, contractual services, um, I mentioned the tree work in the parks for wildfire risk and DPI, DPI security and things of that nature. Um, those are all contracts. And then the biggest expense um, beyond the contracts for FY20 were our personal expenses. I mentioned that we uh, did some hiring we have full -time, uh, four full-time staff that were hired in developed parks and one in uh, natural areas. And that's what those, um, those funds went to. And then we also offset some utility costs um, that were uh, you know, certainly expensive by the tune of $50,000. And that has been really helpful for the other side of the uh, non-levy funds, as you see on the right. So you can see the totals that are uh, close to about three and a half million of levy funding. And then the non-levy funding that helps us operate our park system is uh, just a little over 9 million. And then I'll roll up to uh, the next page. And this just breaks down some of the expenses. And you can see materials and supplies, once again, is one of the biggest things that we uh, have spent the money on. But it takes a lot of resources to operate a park system with just a little over, uh, I believe it's 40, 4,800 acres of park, uh, park land. Is that correct, Carolyn? We're a little over 48 now with some acquisition. We're over 5,000. 
Yeah, so we're over 5,000 acres. So, uh, you know, it's not surprising that with 5,000 acres of parkland that most of our resources go to materials and supplies, contracts and personnel. So we've spent uh, not quite a million dollars in general park maintenance to get that done. And I mentioned the trails and the natural areas, how important they are. It's very similar um, in the categories with materials and supplies, contractual services, and then personal expenses um, stacking up as the big ones. And then, so we're at 721,000 and about $58 for that. And then the public safety presence, which Kelly will talk about in a minute, uh, materials and supplies, you know, contractual services once again, and personal expenses to the tune of uh, just a little shy of about 700,000. So to actually about 871,000. So, so with that, as we roll up. You know, I'll, maybe I'll just chime in on the recreation maintenance. Oh, sure. I can't see that on my screen. It's blocked oh. by people. Oh, sorry. So uh, here. I can pull it up on my screen. So we did have some recreation. And I think my guess is um, that that was in part um, related to Amazon pool winterization. Um, I don't know if anybody else can speak to that, but you know, when when we our plan was to close the um, close Echo Hollow, that we would open Amazon. And in, uh, in order to offset that loss of, of water. And, um, and so we needed to do some improvements to Amazon pool in order to winterize it, to make it usable um, throughout the winter. I haven't that's really exactly, needed to do that, but. That's exactly it, Carolyn, to, okay. to winterize it, the, the whole system and to de-winterize it and winterize it again, right. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I feel like I hurried, but um, I'm probably a little over time. So uh, Kelly Darnell and questions afterwards. Thanks, Chris. Um, I just wanna give a quick shout out to Alyssa who coordinates all of us in getting this really important report out. She makes sure we are, get our stuff in on time and make sure we have good photos and goes gets more photos. And so I just want to say thank you so much to Alyssa for putting this whole thing together, which is a lot. Yes. <laughs> to Peral. So thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, um, Alyssa. <laughs> so uh, we, while we got the bond projects going and we have the levy work going, we wanted to talk to the community and find out what their impressions are of our levy work. Are they noticing the difference? Do they associate it with the levy, et cetera? And so we worked with the Terrell Group this summer to um, create a survey around levy funding. And it, we uh, had over 2,300 people take the survey, including 27 people that were, uh, took it in Spanish. And some of the key findings we want to make sure we included in this report um, were that 45% of respondents felt that our their parks are extremely or very safe, and an additional 42%. Um, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to start there. Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to go back up a little bit further here. Um, so we found that 90% of the respondents indicated that parks are extremely or very important to their quality of life, and 78% are at parks daily or weekly. Um, we found that the people that were the most satisfied with the park system are the ones that go there the most often. So if um, you're going daily or weekly, you're saying that you're finding a parks extremely or very well maintained. So that was an interesting piece to learn. 73% um, of respondents feel the levy was completely or mostly worth the expense. They have noticed the increased care of trees and vegetation, reopened restrooms and more portable toilets, increased trail maintenance and added trash services. The top two priorities for existing parks are ongoing park maintenance, such as moving litter and garbage, mowing, cleaning restrooms, and cleaning up of homeless encampments in public parks. The only place this differed a little bit was it was really consistent across all wards except for folks in Southeast Eugene uh, placed cleaning of homeless encampments as their third priority, uh, but they have less, a significantly less amount of camping in their neighborhood than many other neighborhoods. So um, 
And that kind of leads me into this feeling of safety. 45% um, of respondents feel parks are extremely or very safe. An additional 42% feel moderately safe. Um, people who use the parks daily feel the safest with 51% selecting either extremely or very safe. And those, interesting enough, who rarely visit their parks um, feel the least safe. So um, for those that felt that the parks that were safer this year over last year, 78% um, said the main reason was because they were seeing less illegal campers. And then a third of park users felt less safe in parks this year compared to last year. And again, the primary reason, 74%, was uh, illegal camping and drug use. And so um, we think that it also could have played into this. We had a significant chunk of time where we weren't enforcing park rules and sort of camping really exploded and the calls from the public were constant. And so, you know, there is possibly a role that that played in um, this answer. And then um, uh, we also, you know, planned this survey before COVID-19 happened. And um, so we did decide to throw in a question and we just found that people that were already using the parks a lot used them even more and the people that weren't using them that much, you know, used them a little bit less. So, um, and then the last piece uh, was equity in parks. Uh, while the survey didn't directly address equity, there were some questions that kind of elicited some response around equity. Um, just as a side note, we have recently like overlaid census data around income with where camping occurs and it, our lowest income neighborhoods are the most impacted by camping in their neighborhood parks. And so um, it was really striking to overlay that camping data with um, the census data around income levels. And so um, then these answers didn't surprise us as much either. So. Um, when asked what prevents you from visiting Eugene Parks, those in the Bethel Geneva area were significantly more likely to select concern about their personal safety, 42% than in South East Eugene. We found that the folks in South East Eugene are really feeling pretty, pretty safe. So um, definitely big differences. South Eugene, South East Eugene and South Eugene were pretty different in a lot of the responses than other parts of Eugene. So that was that was pretty interesting. And then the River Road Santa Clara area had a higher number of people who indicated there was lack of parks near their house, which, you know, is going to change as we have Santa Clara Community Park and Ferndale Park and all those other things coming online in those areas. And so um, that is a little overview of the survey that um, we did. And I think that's it for me. Thanks, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's it for the levy um, report. Are there any questions for either Chris or Kelly? This, this Scott. Scott, I, I, have, I have a question. Um, so we're, it's crazy to say this, but almost two and a half years into the levy. And I know you guys mentioned that it's mainly back in funded, so to speak, like it takes time to ramp things up. Uh, any sense what it'll look like on the other side of the five years? I mean, obviously I'm assuming we're gonna go out for some other, you know, extension of the levy. Will, do we think it'll be at the same level or, cause some of the projects we're doing like Echo Hollow, Sheldon, a lot of what we're doing is just improving what we already have. Uh, we are adding some additional assets to the system, but I, I know it's still early, but time flies, right? Kind of where do we see ourselves uh, come two and a half years from now. I'll Just jump in, I'll sure. jump in here really quickly. Um, I, you know, it, it really is a little too early, Scott, for us to give a specific, I think, you know, our, our original um, amount that we went out for on the levy uh, closed an operating gap that we had identified back in basically 2014. And as we've all been talking about tonight, costs have significantly escalated. And by the time we actually got on the ballot, um, I mean, our gap was considerably larger so we would have loved to have actually asked for a little bit more money and i think we will will anticipate doing so but so much of it just relies on where the economy is at at the time and um you know the the passage of the recent library levy is very encouraging for us and also the results of the survey that you just saw um, are very encouraging for us um but you know it's just it's a tough thing to really 
say specifically how much we'd be able to ask right now. I think we're just have to gauge it as we go along. So we shouldn't, we should know better in about a year or so. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I mean, I don't think it's, yeah, it's tough to say amount or anything right now, but just kind of get us, you guys are thinking about it, I guess is more my question. Uh, uh, every day. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can, can I add in there too, uh, Scott, you know, when we went out for the levy, council asked us to look at other alternative uh, funding mechanisms, and we haven't yet completed that uh, or loop back with council on that. So while we think the levy has been, um, obviously it's been beneficial for the community and for our teams, um, it's not a given that we would pursue a levy. We still have to have that conversation. Um, so more to come. We have started some of those conversations internally, at least. It's tough. I mean, everybody's looking for other sources of revenue, right? That's the tough thing. All right. Yeah, if we could if we could find a more stable source of funding, that would be fantastic. Great. I'll let you know if I come up with anything. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Other questions? Molly. So this may be completely out of place, but I was curious under what department do dog parks fall? Parks. Parks, okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that's different from parks and recreation? Well, so there's the recreation division and then there's the parks and open space division mm -hmm. and they fall under the parks and open space division. So you've got the right group here. Okay. Yeah, I, I just just curious. Um, I, I, I have I've just had some personal experience that dog parks are very um, on wheelchair friendly. So, uh, you know, I, I've I really like to advocate for more accessible dog parks, more dog parks, and bigger dog parks. Okay. And I mean, I, I haven't seen those on any anything that we've uh, talked about. Um, we will be, um, pres it's likely that we'll be building a new dog park at Santa Clara Community Park. Um, that's the, you know, community park that um, for that area and there is not a dog park there. And so we are thinking that will probably be prioritized and we're in the planning process right now and um, not, not this winter, but next winter we'll be doing those um, construction documents. And um, I think that we would um, love to hear your perspective because I think um, you're right. Uh, a lot of those are soft surface paths and they're muddy and, you know, yeah, not, not ideal, so. Yeah, or they're big chunky gravel, which is impossible, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So Molly, our, our uh, operations section, Chris Gerard manages, uh, we often go back in and do some renovations on, on the, the paths in those parks. And uh, we could definitely put you in connection with some, some of the, our folks so we can get a little bit of your sense of what you're seeing and how we can do better. Sure, yeah, um, I'm an engineer and an architect so I can read drawings and I understand what different surfaces are, how that impacts people with disabilities. So please do, happy to, happy to volunteer for that. Awesome. Thanks, Molly. Yeah. Other thoughts, questions, considerations? Well, um, boy, we're a minute away from um, wrapping up here, but I know Ethan wanted to talk about our next meeting because it would be great to get something on the books, you know, sooner than later. Um, Ethan, can I turn it over to you? Yeah. Yeah, I'll carry us across the six o'clock. <laughs> Thanks. I move quickly. Um, so what we're tentatively, what we're thinking is that we'll provide, Carolyn and I will, will likely provide the board with an update in December uh, with the report's final draft, an update of the audit status and any project updates that would happen between now and December, which, which may not be much, it may not be super substantial um, unless people felt inclined to advocate advocate for a meeting in December. Uh, otherwise, that would be the plan for December. Uh, and in January, we, we would meet again, um, likely virtual based on the way things are going. Um, and that would be to review or to draw up this year's cover letter or pro providing information to council. Um, 
It would also include further project updates. What we're eyeballing right now is Tuesday, January 26th uh, at 4 p.m. Same duration, same time slot, same day of the week. Um, does that work for those of you that are here? I think just Dr. Kincaid is gone. It would work for me. No, I don't see any of these. So did you say Tuesday, January? 26th. 26th. At this point, it's wide open that far out. So I try to claim them you know, well in advance. Um, People of dibs. Um, and then after that, once we have that meeting, I think we're eyeballing May because in May, we're expecting a lot of our, our uh, projects to be either really close to completion or completed um, or beginning for some of our new projects. So um, that is the plan for now. And that is the momentum we're trying to rebuild after this brief hiatus. And the idea in May is uh, that maybe we could actually go on site together and do some project tours. So, yeah. So yeah, so just a, a kind of uh, email check-in in December, a January 26th meeting, and then keep our fingers crossed for May. Sound good? Cool. Okay, well then, um, let everybody go get dinner. Really, really awesome seeing you. Thanks for hanging in there for to our end of the day meeting. And um, yeah, we'll yeah. we'll be in touch. See you. Thank Happy you Thanksgiving. To us. Thanks, everybody. Happy Thanks, Thanksgiving. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye.